There are four right exertions altogether. The exertion to prevent unskillful qualities from arising, the exertion to abandon any unskillful ones that have already arisen, the effort to give rise to skillful qualities that have not yet arisen, and the effort to develop the ones that have. Within well, skillful qualities, we try our best to prevent them, but there are times when we slip. They moved in and invaded the mind. And you've got to do something about them. You can't just sit there and let them take over. At the very least, you want to have one part of the mind that recognizes that they're not skillful and is determined not to give in. In the John Munn's final sermon, it's just that the soldier in the battle is that determination not to come back and be the laughing stock of the defilements ever again. You've got to keep that determination strong, even when the soldier is not well fed and when the enemy is really strong. We've got to hold on to that determination. The problem when a Unskillful qualities moved in. You're sometimes dealing with it is like a civil war. It's not an ordinary battle. People have been friends suddenly aren't friends anymore inside the mind. That means they know each other very well. So you have to be especially careful about the ways that unskillful thoughts insinuate themselves into your mind and then try to lay claim. The Buddha gives five ways of dealing with unskillful thoughts that have arisen, but they all depend on that determination not to give in, to recognize these things as things you don't want to get involved with, and the willingness to see those parts of the mind as, as strangers. And this is where John Lee's image of all the different consciousnesses in your mind comes in really handy. The desire to give in to lust, the desire to stay with your lust or to stay with your anger. They'll say, well, they're already there. What are you going to do about it? You've already made your choice. You can unmake that choice. You're not committed to it. It's amazing how once the mind gets into a state like that and the unskillful state has taken over it. It can claim, okay, you're committed, can't leave. And you realize that it's someone who's really not fair, someone who's really not honest. And so why are you so committed to them? You can break off the engagement whenever you want. That's the first thing to keep in mind. The second thing, of course, is to figure out well, what does this disfilement want? After all, it was a part of you at one point. It was something that you fed because it gave you some pleasure. By now, though, you should know better. So the question is, what are you still looking for? What is it in that unskillful mind state that thinks it's going to gain something? What are you going to get? Look at it carefully, because often it's something you don't expect. You've got all the reasons for not giving in, and yet for some reason there's a part of the mind that wants to go with it. Okay, it's got some agenda. Then you want to question it. You want to thwart it to see what its demands are, what its expectations are. And by holding it at bay. It will say, you're going to give in at some point anyhow, so why don't you just give in now? Don't believe it. When you hold it at bay, it'll keep coming back, coming back, and coming back. But each time it comes back, it'll come back with something that's slightly different. And at some point it's going to slip. It's going to give you its real reasons. You recognize them. Oh, that's what I thought I was going to get out of that. 
the part of you that was still there in that defilement, that was still deceived. So your first line of defense is just that, to draw a line. Say, nope, we're not going to step over this line, regardless. And then do whatever you can to strengthen your side and to weaken the other side. And don't get frustrated because it takes time, because after all, these defilements have been in charge for a long, long time, and they're not going to give up easily. They've got their reasons, they've got their little pleasures that they use to tempt you. And like people who've been in power for a long time, they just kind of like to throw around the impression that they've got a lot of influence and that they're inevitable. Well, they're not. As John Lee points out, there's a suffering that comes from just having a body, and this is natural. The suffering that comes from defilements is not natural and it's not necessary. It's simply a bad habit you picked up. This is one of the reasons why we work with the precepts. We have some clear lines that we stick by, that we're not going to overstep whatever, whatever comes. Remember John Fuang asking me one time, what struck me that one of the things he'd asked me to do was going to take an awful lot out of me. He said, are you afraid to die? Now, in most places, everyone would say, well, yes, of course, but the way he said it was Sounded like, oh, that's something to be ashamed of. If it's for the sake of what's good, you say, I'm willing to die. And then you see, are you really going to die if you have to fend off greed or fend off lust or fend off anger? No. So what are you afraid of? Don't be afraid of your defilements. There are times when you have to respect the fact that you can't quite get past them yet, but you want to see if you can fence them in. The same way that you'd fence in a wild animal. It's going to use everything it can to get around the fence. And you learn a lot about a wild animal when it's fenced in like that. You wouldn't learn otherwise. And it's the same with your defilement. Keep it fenced in. Just say, nope. I'm not going to act on that. It may be raging in the mind, but I'm not going to act on it. And in the course of its rages, you'll get to see it in ways that you don't normally get to see it. This is important because it helps you gain, help you gain some insight into what's driving it. Why, even though you've heard the drama again and again and again, you go for these unskillful things. Maintaining that line is what allows all the other techniques to work. When the Buddha talks about replacing an unskillful thought with something more skillful, for example, working with the breath, where in the body do you feel the irritation that aggravates your lust? We'll see if you can breathe in a way that soothes that irritation. A good place to start is on the back of your hands, on the tops of your feet, and then work up from those. The second technique is to look at the drawbacks of that kind of thinking. Where would it lead you? What rewards would it give you? And how do they compare to the rewards of not giving in? If that doesn't work, look away. Otherwise, don't pay attention to it. You've got the breath. It can be raging. You don't have to do anything with it. So, because some defilements are like those tar traps that they set out for monkeys. You touch it and you're caught. So you just don't touch it. If you can notice where the activity 
of falling through with that defilement is churning away, not only in the mind, but it's also going to have a spot in the body. Find that spot. Breathe through that. As the Buddha said, if none of these things worked, put your tongue against the roof of your mouth. And as he says, crush your mind with your mind. Just in other words, whatever little tiny thought that might come up, you just crush it with as much strength as you have. The Taijans talk about using Bhutto really fast as a way of blocking it. John Mahabhava gives the example of a fighter who's been knocked down but still doesn't give in. Yells insults at the other, at the opponent, even as he's down on the down on the floor. In other words, the important thing is that you don't see the unskillful state as something good. That's your main defense, because one of the big problems with the defilements and big problems with the hindrances is that you tend to fall in with them so easily. The things that you lust for really are worth inciting lust. The things you're angry for really are outrageous. When you're feeling sleepy, oh yeah, the body needs some rest. When things you're worried about, oh, there's, there's really are genuine things to worry about. Things you're doubtful about, yeah, they're doubtful. You fall in with these things so easily. It's good to step back. Think about other people having these defilements. When the Buddha talks about being mindful of things inside, we'll also be mindful of things outside. When you're overcome by lust, think about the things that other people lust for that you find really disgusting. So what's better about your lust? So think about other people's worries. I got a phone call tonight from the, from a monk who seems to can't move at all without fear that he's breaking some rule. You need to look at his worries and you say they're outrageous. And then turn around and look at your worries. You say, well, this is what lust looks like from the outside. This is what anger looks like from the outside. That's a very helpful reflection. This is what laziness looks like from the outside. Do you want to look like that? There are lots of different ways for dealing with skillful thoughts that have taken over. The important thing is that you have the determination to stick with the fight no matter what. 